a six-time All-Star, Gold Glove winner, former manager of the Angels, Phillies, Blue Jays, and our Chicago White Sox, Jim Fergosi. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I hear you're scouting today. Well, I am doing that. I'm at the uh, ballpark in Tampa. The game's going to start in a very few minutes. So You call that work? Well, you know, it's a tough job. But <laughs> somebody's got to do it. I have to go to a baseball game almost every day. Oh. You know, it's a tough business. Man. So how'd you end up working for the Braves? You know, after uh, I left Toronto, I was uh, up for a couple managing jobs. And uh, when they were all filled, John Sherholz called me and he said, uh, would you like to go to work for me? And I said, yes. And here it is, 11 years later, and I'm still working there. So there, it's a great organization, great people to work for, and uh, they've had a lot of success, and it's uh, it's really nice to be part of it. Is Sherholt still part of the Braves organization? Yes, he's the president of the team. Because there was some talk here that the club should go basic to the Braves and say, here, we want Jaron Sherholtz as our GM president. He is. Probably the best executive that I have ever come in contact with. He's a uh, he's got great people skills. He's a he's got a great brain. He's uh, knows how to get the most out of people. I think the world of John. He's a, a great guy. Yeah, I mean you can be smart and still not be successful in baseball. How have the Braves managed to maintain that high level? You know for basically decades. I think it's a combination of everything. I, it all starts with scouting, and that's getting the proper players into your organization. And then uh, player development. I think there's been a lot done. Uh, I think professional scouting has become a big part of every organization. And uh, when John first started, before uh, he turned it over to Frank Wren, uh they have never, the Braves have never, ever uh, offered a player, a free agent, a no-trade contract. I think that keeps uh, everything in order where you can do things. If somebody doesn't work out, you're able to get rid of them. I think no-trade contracts somewhat uh, hurt a ball club, but they develop. They've signed a lot of high school players throughout their career, and you know, they uh, have made a changeover through the years uh, and won a 14 straight divisional championships. I think they averaged, John averaged about 10 players a year that he changed off the major league roster. What do you think what's going on here in Chicago? I mean, the GM job is open or president job might be open or slash president GM. It looks like they might have a new manager next year. I mean, what would you do if you're running the Cubs? Well, you know, I don't like to get involved in, in running somebody else's organization. I, I think that uh, Jim Henry's a very good friend of mine. Uh, Mike Quaddy uh, was a AAA manager at Philadelphia when I managed uh, the Phillies. So, I mean, you know, I don't like to get involved in other people's uh, problems or how they're going to run things. Uh, but, I, you know, Chicago Cubs is a great franchise. It's a great city, and, you know, they deserve a winner. As long as they don't bring Hawk Harrelson as their GM, I think we'll be in good shape. <laughs> now, a, a lot of teams are going to using metrics and all this uh, computer stuff. Moneyball. Are, are you a guy who buys into Moneyball, or are you a guy who says, I can see a player when I see him? Well, see, when Moneyball started, uh, I think on the base percentage was invented before that. In 1993, managing the Phillies, we were first in on base percentage at seventh in the National League and hitting with runs, runners in scoring position, but we still scored more runs than anybody in the National League or in baseball. So I think it is a combination of things. Everybody that I know of in this industry uses statistics as part of it. I think the view and the experience of the people that are watching the player 
have a lot to do with it. I think it's a plan that you make that you use everything that is available to you to be able to make the right decision. Our guest later on in the show, Rowan Heeman, I mean, I don't think he knew about sabermetrics, and he was successful with multiple organizations, the White Sox, the Orioles, and I think baseball should get back to that and say, listen, you could look at a player and see if he's good or bad. You don't need all these stats. Well, you know, it's all part of the overall picture. I think it's important to know statistics about a player. I think it's the most important thing is knowing what makes the individual tick and how he is going to fit on your 25-man roster, how he's going to fit in your organization. Personality-wise, how about how he goes about his business, what kind of player he is, how much of a teammate is he. I think all those things all come into the, the final decision. What John Sherholtz did and what Frank Wren does in Atlanta, he listens to his people and then he makes a final decision. As an advanced scout, are you able to find out what these players are like? I am really not an advanced scout. I am senior advisor player personnel. I see all 30 major league clubs play for strictly for trades and free agent signings. So I see everybody. And believe me, in this game, I've been around for 50 years. I know everybody. I know uh, people in the clubhouse. I know writers. I know coaches. I know managers. So part of my job is to learn and to know the personality of each player that we have made a decision that we might want to bring them in. For instance, I can give you an example. We made a trade this winter for Dan Uglis. Uglis started out awful this year. He was hitting 170. He wasn't hitting home runs. But we knew that sooner or later that he would come out of it. He never not ran a ball out. He always hustled, and he always gave his all. Right now he's got 30 home runs, and the, the first second baseman in the history of the game to hit 30-plus home runs his first five years in the big league. So you got to know about the personality and the makeup of the individual. I'll tell you what, that bullpen the Braves had is incredible in the back end with Venners and Kimbrell. I mean, it's the best I've seen probably since the Reds with the Nasty Boys with Dibble and Charlton. Well, I go back a little further than that. Uh, you know, I would go back to Pittsburgh when they had Terry Forrester and Goose Gollett, Dossage and, and Kent DeCulvey and Grant Jackson. These young players that we have in our organization, uh, there's another, there's O'Flaherty that's in that group and there's a young pitcher that we just brought up by the name of Vizcaino who throws 100 miles an hour. Uh, it is it is close to the best young bullpen I have ever seen. They have uh, done a marvelous job for us and they're great kids. And and the you know the retirement of Bobby Cox you'd hardly know he's gone from the dugout as manager. Well, you know Bobby Freddie Gonzalez worked for Bobby Cox, and they are live right down the street from each other. They have coffee in the mornings. They are the best of friends. I think it was a wonderful choice to bring Freddie in to manage the club. Bobby needs some time. I mean, he's at the age now. He should uh, sniff the roses a little bit and enjoy his summers with his family and, and grandkids and I just think he's great that he's still part of the organization and what a wonderful guy and man he was, and he's a future Hall of Famer. What about you? You're 69. Are you ready to go back in the dugout, or are you like being I'm, in the front well, office? I'm way too young <laughs> That's to what go Jack back Ma- on the field. That's what Jack McKeon said to you, right? M- McKeon, at 80, is doing a good job in Florida, and I, at 69, I'm just way too young to go back on the field. So in another 10 sorry, years or so, you'll be ready? Yeah, about 10 years. I, you know, I, I should be ready. I want to go to your point career with the Angels. I mean, you were with the Angels right basically when they first started. What was it like basically going to L.A., California Angels and playing out there? Well, you know, I was signed originally by the Boston Red Sox, and I went in the first expansion draft, you know, to go to, to California where I was born and raised and going back 
to the Los Angeles area with Gene Autry as an owner, it was really kind of a thrill for me. And, you know, to be able to play on a major league level at 19 years old and be part of a new franchise, uh, you know, we go back where myself, Bobby Knopp, and Buck Rogers, we used to sell season tickets during the off season, and we really felt like that was our family, the organization, the Angel organization. Who was the best pitcher you ever went up against? Well, you know, the best or the toughest on me, uh, I thought Jim Bunning from the right side was as tough a pitcher on me, him and Earl Wilson, who was at Boston. And probably left-handed, the guy with the best stuff was uh, Sutton Sam McDowell, who, uh, who had let the league in strikeouts every year, probably had as good as stuff. And, of course, facing Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale was no cup of tea. And you had a pretty good pitcher who was a teammate, and you also managed Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan uh, was probably the greatest power pitcher that ever played the game. I mean, when you talk about keeping your fastball, uh, his mechanics, his work ethics uh, – were just outstanding, but for somebody to keep their fastball as long as he did, it's it's an amazing story. Now, what was it like going from the West Coast with the Angels to the East Coast with the Mets in New York? Well, you know, it was a difficult transition for me because, you know, I've always been part of the Angel organization, and uh, to leave, I never thought I would ever leave that organization, but we didn't have... Uh, as players did not have the protection of no trade contracts or five and ten year contracts, uh, ten years in the major leagues, five years with the same club, so they could just do what they wanted with you. And really, there was no free agency then, so you couldn't uh, pick the spot you wanted to go to. I probably would not have picked playing for the Mets. Uh, I would have probably and played someplace else if the Angels did not want me, if I had any say-so in it. And then you went to the White Sox as a manager in the mid-'80s. I mean, what was that like working for Jerry Reinsdorf? And I think, again, uh, their broadcaster was their GM the one year in 87. Well, Jerry Reinsdorf is one of the best owners that I ever worked for. Uh, he understands the game. He likes the game. He's He probably treats his people that work for him and their organization better than any other organization in baseball. He's got a great deal of loyalty to the people that work for him. So it was a very enjoyable time for me. Uh, the only problem I, I really ever had was uh, with the general manager, Larry Hines. Was Larry a tough guy to work for? Why, yeah, I thought he was the most difficult guy in the world to work for. He had his own way. He had a little different philosophy about Major League Baseball, and we just didn't see eye to eye on about a lot of things. With the Cubs now, a lot of it, like you mentioned earlier, these no trade clauses, the Cubs GM kind of put him in a pickle because he gave all these guys no trade clauses, long-term contracts, and he basically tied the hands of himself the last couple of years with the new ownership because he couldn't do anything. Do you think the new GM is going to have to have free reign and say, listen, I'm going to run it my way, tell Ricketts, and that's it, and there's no no trade clauses, there's no long-term contracts, I'm going to build well, from know, within? The one, the one thing that you have to remember, the man with the gold makes the golden rules. As an owner of a major league team, you should have the right to set some policies. The general manager should be allowed to handle the baseball thing, but he should also enforce the policies of the ownership. I mean, if the owner wants to go sign somebody, you should try to get that player signed. Uh, I don't believe in giving extremely long contracts, and I don't believe in no trade contracts, but that's me personally. Now, you went from playing career to managerial, big league managerial career. Do you think that's good, bad, or doesn't matter? Well, I went, uh, I was playing one day and I managed the next. Uh, so it was a difficult transition for me because of the reason that I went back to California where I knew everybody. I knew all the writers, I knew the players. 
I knew the area. And the toughest part of it for me was the friendships I had. Everybody thought they could manage the club better than me. Uh, but I, after I left there and got fired by Buzzy and Pacey, I went back to the minor leagues and learned more about my profession as far as a manager is concerned. And I spent four years in AAA managing there and for the St. Louis Cardinals. And I enjoyed that. I learned about what it takes to manage and what it takes to handle people. And uh, really, Billy Reed, a, a writer for the Louisville Courier at that time, helped me as far as trying to uh, understand what the press's job is and how to handle those kind of things as far as Major League Baseball is concerned. A lot was made with Detroit when they heard Alan Trammell. Basically, he was a fan favorite. He failed with the Tigers. And in Chicago, they were afraid to hire Ryan Sandberg, some people said, because if he failed, you'd basically lose him from the organization. Well, they've lost him from the organization. He's managing AAA for the Phillies. So you don't think he'd come back and manage the Cubs if they offered it to him? Well, I'm certain if he, he wants to manage in the major leagues, he did a fine job at the morning. He's doing a fine job uh, at Lehigh Valley right now. Uh, so he deserves and probably will get an opportunity to manage very soon. The biggest travesty is that you're not in the Hall of Fame. I don't get it. Well, you know, it's a whole different thing that playing and managing basically on the West Coast. When I played, they didn't even have the box scores in the New York papers. So it was a definite advantage for somebody playing on on the East Coast as opposed to the West Coast. But I uh, I have been fortunate enough to have been in the game for 50-some years. Uh, as an old saying, the game's been very, very good to me. I have a great deal of loyalty to the people that I work for. I enjoy the game still, and I enjoy the camaraderie of the people on and off the field that I know in the American and National League. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Fergosi. It was a pleasure talking to you. All right. Take care. Thanks. You, you too. too.